It's time once again for Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist May Brussel, who for five years has shared with us her extensive research into political assassinations and abuses of power in this country. Her program relates the news of the week to emerging evidence about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains by force its control over the legislative, executive, and judicial processes in America. And now, May Brussel. Good afternoon. This is May Brussel in Carmel, California, November 22nd, 1976, and this is the anniversary of the assassination of John Kennedy. It's 13 years since John Kennedy was killed. I spoke about uh, the new committee in Washington, D.C. last week, and I did want to get onto a subject which is important in uh, showing how current investigations only tell in their reports a fraction of the truth and how important it is to get the original documents and manuscripts. Because the way I studied the Warren report was to read the report first, then take the 26 volumes of witness testimony and exhibits and evidence, and found out that the resemblance to the Warren report of the actual exhibits and documents was so different, it was so wide and gross that uh, you came to a different conclusion after you read the Warren Report. Now, the Rockefeller Committee in uh, Washington, D.C. did a little investigation into the testing of LSD, and they briefly mentioned the fact that Dr. Frank Olson had committed suicide. He was surreptitiously given LSD in a drink, and then he began to lose his mind, and they called his wife in Maryland and said that he had to go to New York to a psychiatrist, and he went to a doctor who actually wasn't a psychiatrist, and in that interim, they brought him back to Washington. He was to be committed to a mental hospital, and then they decided uh, to take him back to New York, and he went out the 10th floor of a window, and that was the end of Dr. Olson. And it, this news account uh, got a lot of coverage, and there was a lawsuit and a settlement with the Olson family. But the story of LSD, the use of LSD, is so massive and so important, or the use of chemicals by the government, that I wanted to read to you today a list of institutions that were financed to continue these researches, the kind of funding that went behind it, and the massive amount of brain altering that took place, because this has not come up front yet. A researcher, a very fine person in the New York area, uh, got this information from the Department of the Army. Uh, it's called the Use of Volunteers in Chemical Agent Research. And it was declassified March 1976, and it isn't available except by going to the Pentagon, and it's signed by William N. Johnson, Major uh, Investigations Division from the Department of Army. And what was sent to me was Chapter 9 on Intelligence Core Experimentation with Hallucinogenic Drugs. And the code name for the drug, the LSD, was to be EA1729. And this report is about the experimentation solely of hallucinogenic drugs. And then it gets into the place in Tulane University where they tested the hallucinogenic drugs with electrodes in people's brains, and that came from the... A private foundation, the electrodes came from the Commonwealth Foundation that was responsible for the electrodes, and the Army provided the LSD. I'm going to be quoting also uh, Chapter 10, Contracts with Civilian Institutions. That's where it came out in the news recently that they used Vacaville Prison for uh, CIA testing of chemical drugs. And I'm going to read from pages 152 to 166 of this same report, the use of volunteers in chemical agents and research. And then I'm going to read from the same report, attachment uh, C, page 212, the summary of the contract costs of mine experimentation. This is from 1950 to 1975. And I'm going slowly here because I'm going to run down just a lot of names, a lot of dates, a lot of figures. I don't expect you to remember them. The important thing is this that the CIA made the settlement with Dr. Olson and with one other family. There's a lawsuit now for a death that was caused by their experimentation. But in these pages of the documents I have here, they 
tested many many more people than they are describing and i'm going in to just the funds the experimentation began early in one nine hundred fifty this is an outline from the army report themselves this is the kind of thing that mark lane calls irresponsible that i've talked about but this is signed by a colonel a major and a lieutenant on the use of volunteers and chemical agent research the year in the early fifty's they began a program the u s army intelligence in conjunction with the u s chemical corps experimentation with the loose agenic drugs the interest of beginning was the threat of potential enemies using this drug how to counteract them and they were also interested in improving our interrogation methods but after they satisfied themselves they went much further by may nineteen fifty six the chemical warfare laboratories uh, stationed at Edgewood Arsenal started to use what they called human volunteers. This is in 1956. Now I turn to this document on how they got their volunteers, and it said that the chemical warfare laboratory at Edgewood received authority to use human volunteers in 1956 in conjunction with Fort Holabird and the chemical warfare laboratory. Now, this is the way they got the volunteers. They take certain people and they give them physical examinations in the morning and noon. They had a three-day testing program. And they, this is what they said. They will give a physical examination in the morning and afternoon. And after the three-day stay, they would take their volunteers. Now, in the course of this gathering in the evening, the early evening of the first day after the re arrival, the group would meet in a room provided by the Army Chemical Corps staff. And in the course of this gathering, alcoholic beverages will be served to the group. But prior arrangement will, will have been made to pair each person who's going to have his beverage with another member of the Chemical Corps staff. So every volunteer guest at this gathering would have somebody paired next to him that would be a trained interrogator. And the interrogator will have had an opportunity to study the dossier of this subject to be observed. In other words, they asked for volunteers for chemical studies or people were invited for a three-day session such as Dr. Frank Olson had out in the country, a little woodsy thing with the CIA. And paired up to every person who was there was somebody who knew their complete life had a dossier on the subject that he was assigned to. Then they simulated a social situation. This is on page 136 of the Army paper. I have to say this so you won't believe I'm making it up. They simulated a social situation comparable to what would be a diplomatic cocktail party where an attempt would be made to derive classified information from an unwitting uh, material influence subject. All beverages that were to be served at this simulated cocktail party, alcoholic or otherwise, were served the volunteers, and they will include sufficient EA-1729, which is LSD, for at least an effective dosage of everyone concerned. And during the course of the gathering, the individual observer will try to associate with their designated subject and get information from them. Where necessary, the observer may administer an additional dosage during the contact with his subject. And then they were given at the social evening of the first evening one or additional, that doesn't say whether it was one, two, or three doses of LSD, then if they pass certain tests, the volunteers would be told they were selected on the basis of security clearances or military intelligence. So the point, they were tested under LSD for memory impairment or retention ability of the subject, a reaction to memory test or their motor reaction, the impairment of simple motor reaction on LSD, and they were kept in isolation and given what would be hostile interrogation situations or unusual stress. Now the point is this, they begin their document right off the bat by saying that the very first evening surreptitiously the future volunteers would be given LSD. So therefore there is no such thing as a volunteer because he doesn't have his full consciousness. If he signed a thing he already had been given this LSD and so there's no way of knowing whether he signed it of his free will or whether he was under duress of the chemicals or what they were made of, what this LSD was made of, what combinations or whether it was pure acid. So 
that when they refer to volunteers, you have to understand that they already were administered one or two doses of LSD. Now, that was in 1956, the Chemical Warfare Laboratories. In 19, late 56 up to November 1957, the LSD studies were combined between Army Intelligence at Fort Holabird and Chemical Warfare Labs at the Edgewood Center Arsenal. By March 1958, the testing program, the early LSD testing program, was sufficient enough to discuss two things. Number one, the method of approaching people, personnel, and records and security clearance, and how to get them to, they had to sign papers that any experiments or anything they took or ate or drank was top secret. They couldn't complain. They couldn't reveal later. They couldn't talk about what was administered. Uh, they were volunteers on the basis that no matter what happened to them, physical breakdowns, they had to sign a paper that they couldn't complain about their physical condition. And the general explanation of their tests, the exact properties of the chemicals, was not told to them. They signed what were supposed to be voluntary papers with no indication, according to the Army, of what could happen, what chemicals would be injected to them. They were never told. And so the procedure was to add one dose or two doses, test their memory, their motor reaction, stress, isolation, and then begin to uh, formally test them after all this had happened. Now, the tests by July 1961 were over, and the uh, Rockefeller Committee, the other uh, Senate Committee hearings tell you the tests were over. But that wasn't all. The government papers say that by 61, the tests were over, that's their words, but then they were ready for operational advantage. So when you hear that the government tested LSD or chemicals from 1956 to 1961, they tested them in those years, but they used them up through 1975 because the report is dated up through 75. So they've been operational, and you're splitting hairs. You almost have to be a lawyer or study commission reports or documents long enough to understand how the language changes. So, and these were the most secret uh, CIA experiments that ever were conducted. They were used later on Operation Chaos. They were used on the New Left. And uh, from the very beginning, this group was isolated from every other group in the CIA, and there was no way to check up what was happening to these people. In February of 27, 1962, there was one LSD program set up in Hawaii called Operation Derby Hat. Now that's interesting because when I studied various violences in California that I felt were related to the intelligence community, such as Lawrence Kwong, who shot a KGO, uh, shot Ben Munson and killed him, and then walked down the street and killed himself. He had been in Hawaii in the company of a woman. Uh, Edmund Kemper, I believe, had been in Hawaii, and Herbert Mullen. There was a pattern of many agents maybe from all over the country, but at least in California, who were accompanied by a woman and taken to Hawaii and then came back and started hearing things and had violence on, on killing sprees. So this program was at an Army base in Hawaii, and I have the name of one Army base hospital that one of those people I mentioned stayed at. And they did what they called field testing, but as I say, the operations could begin and the testing was over. By April 10, 1963, there was no indication that the LS, LSD was used by Army intelligence. They uh, were not applying it, but then it could be handed over to the FBI or CIA. So the, the surreptitious administration that was going on continuously was done in violation, admittedly by the, uh, later by the Senate Committee, in violation of the de deputy defense of, in the Army. There were no records found on the majority of these volunteers that, uh, when the uh, Congress went to look into these matters. There were no records, and according to this report, there were none. Some of the records that they had on these tests were incomplete. Most of the records were totally inadequate. Operation Derby Hat in Hawaii was uh, in violation of the Defense Department and the Army Department, and admittedly by the Army in this report, they had total disregard for the moral and ethical standards of conduct governing the use of humans in research. Now, where did they test these and how many uh, did they test? I'll, I'll give you the figures of where they sent their chemicals and the budget. But the projects in the Army report, the summary of the tests, are that it was administered, the LSD, before consent, surreptitiously, 
There was a deliberate effort to deny any information of the hazards. Uh, nobody knew of the hazards that they would get. They failed to inform uh, the people who were volunteers of the drugs that they were getting by the U.S. Uh, Chemical Corps and the military intelligence. They were never given full explanation of the drug properties. And uh, many people were, who so-called volunteered were afraid to be in disfavor if they didn't participate. And one man had said that he was a highly dedicated intelligence corps a person who believed they were making a contribution to national defense by participating. In 1959, there was a memo in this uh, uh, government report that said it is recommended that the actual application of the LSD be utilized in real situations now. In other words, the Army Intelligence and the Army Chemical Corps had done all the tests they needed and they were ready to apply it in real situations. This is data January 21st, 1959. We can field test, we can start overseas on foreign nationals and administer our tests. Now the project for testing it was to go to the G2 Army Intelligence for field, what they called field demonstrations. And they set up teams in Europe and they had no medical doctor to help with these tests. In fact, one of the things that they did was they caused permanent schizophrenia in some people and then called in a doctor for the purpose of discrediting that person or they threaten them. Uh, it comes out in these documents. They threaten, do you want to be permanently insane and use a combination of chemicals to cause permanent insanity? Another operation besides Operation Derby Hat was April 28, 1961 called Operation Third Chance, testing non-volunteers in Europe uh, giving surreptitiously into their beverage. They were not aware of what they were getting, and they were taken to interrogation rooms by doctors and psychologists and experimented upon using what this report says, unconventional techniques, the advanced unconventional techniques. And they suggested that tests go underway for future experimentation for the purpose of operational advantage. That was in 1961. Now, the civilian institutions um, were used all around the country. I'll give you the names of them and where they were. And there were educational institutions, civilian hospitals, private Mar hospitals, the University of Maryland that did the psychological study of chemical warfare agents, and prisons. Vacaville Prison in California was one of them. The University of Maryland had the uh, psychological studies and the effect of chemical warfare agents. And these, there were 54 contracts given out by the Army, and only 14 have been located or admitted, but there were 54 contracts, and they hid these contracts so that the relationship of the CIA wouldn't be linked to them. Now, I have a list of some of the medications in this report that they mentioned, because they not only gave LSD, but they combined it with other chemicals. Uh, one of the first places they used was New York State Psychiatric Institute. They were granted the first known contract for research into psychochemical drugs. The purpose was to determine the psychological effect of, of psychological chemical agents on human subjects, and these subjects were given derivatives of LSD and mescaline, which tells you that they were not given pure LSD. The, the one case that uh, lawsuit pending, a, a person was injected, was very painful mescaline and died a, a horrible death. But the subjects were given derivatives of LSD, and the Army report doesn't say where the derivatives were tested, but these are some of the chemicals, I don't even know if I can pronounce them right, that were mixed with the LSD, and goodness knows what this did to the bodies and personalities because there are no reports or none hardly available of either the people who got the medications or follow-ups who were with them at the time. They tested, as I say, derivatives of LSD and mescaline, and they combined LSD with morphine, Demerol, Secanol, Scopolamine, Ditin, Atropine, Psilocybin, BZ, which is benzolite, glycolate, Atropine substitutes, Dimethyl, Tripamine, Chlorpromazine, LSD with dibenzaline, which is a blocking agent, LSM with his lysergic acid, morpholide, LSD like compounds, psilocybin, and other chemical glycoid agents. 
Uh, these were some of the uh, chemicals that were experimented on these people overseas and at home in our private hospitals. They tested chemicals for choking agents, nerve agents, blood agents, blister agents, vomiting agents, incapacitating agents, and, tox and toxins. And they described in their reports what the, what the glycolates were. They caused incapacitation by interfering with muscles, gland function, the central nervous system. They depress or inhibit the nervous activity in addition to delirium. There's physical incoordination, blurred vision, inhibition of sweating and salivation, rapid heart rate, elevated blood pressure, increased body temperature at high doses, vomiting, prostration, stupor, or coma. And then the terrifying thing is that these medications that have those symptoms could be at uh, onset, could be minutes, hours, or days. I just finished an article on the killing of the various rock musicians in the past nine, ten years, and I brought out the fact of uh, several that died with vomit in their throat that just started vomiting. And the important thing is that they could be administered any one of these poisons, just in a pill or tasteless substance, and die two days later. And it could be diagnosed as an insanity or a suicide, and they could freak out and not be found. Now, what were some of the... Um, Play the purposes of all these chemicals because the chemicals are just names to us and I listed some of the purposes and then I'm going to tell you the institutions where the budget went to. Now I have to say this, uh, the budget that I added up according to their report and this is only one report, this is just about 30 pages of Army chemical testing. This isn't Navy intelligence, this isn't Yale University, Dr. Delgado, this isn't Hughes Medical Institute or any of the many, many private people that are overlapping and doing the same kind of research. This is one government report that they spent $26 million, $26 million, and $446. I don't know why they never come out with a rounded figure like $26,500,000, but they take it down to the last $6. But uh, you know that Dr. Olson, or the one other case that is suing, uh, if they were damaged, you know that there's something wrong with spending $26 million. It turned out that Alan Dulles had bought 100 million LSD tablets for $146,000 when he was alive to all their human behavior. That's one half of the American population could receive LSD that Alan Dulles had bought for $146,000. So you have to say what was the U.S. Chemicals Corps and the U.S. Army Intelligence doing with tax dollars of $26 million that went to 48 institutions? This is scandalous, and this is the first time on the air that this report has ever been revealed, and I will be writing about it for national magazines. Now, here are some of the things that they did with his money, and I'll give you the names of some of the institutions. They wanted to measure the effect of these incapacitating agents. They wanted to study the drug effects and complex behavioral uh, repertories, the physiological effect of atrophine and atrophine substitutes, the effect of drugs with chemical warfare agents, clinical, pathological, and pathophysiological studies in anticholinesterase poisoning, search for new incapacitating agents, as if this isn't enough, a pilot performance test for benzoin, giving airplane pilots benzoin before they took off to see uh, how they did under the effect of this drug. Determine psychological effects of psycho psychological, the chemical agents on human subjects. They studied the endocrinologic effects of altered consciousness. Psychiatric and therapeutic studies of compounds. Studies of compound tests. Psychiatric, psychological, and therapeutic studies of uh, various compounds, the clinical study during the administration of mescaline, chloroformazine, and other drugs to study the compound affecting the central nervous system in man and animal, the neurological action of chemical warfare agents, the investigation of ryanosine. I don't even know what some of these chemicals are. I'm just repeating where these contracts went, and I'll tell you some of the institutions. The pharma pharmacological influence on neural and spinal synaptic junctions, the evaluation and the synthesis of these compounds, incapacitating agent research. These are the titles of projects 
of where 26 million went out to 48 institutions to evaluate and synthesize compound chemicals on humans, to study the threshold doses of chemicals in humans, the drug effect and complex behavior of persons with chemical compounds, subtle toxic effects produced by drugs in humans, to study the behavior during the administration of LSD uh, number 25 plus mescaline plus electric shock, the psychological study effect of chemical warfare agents, research of chemicals in demand, the evaluation of drugs in man, neurological action of agents. Now, the original reports said that the government had 1,074 volunteers. It's very hard to believe that given 30 or 40 project titles just from Army Intelligence and U.S. Chemical Corps spending $26 million in 48 institutions, that every institution had just three people being tested, I hardly believe it. And now I want to read you some of the figures of where the money went for these contracts because it's outrageous. And while these figures, as I say, don't mean much to you, if you have a computer mind, you can add $26 million. If you send a self-addressed stamped envelope, I'll send you a list of the institutions and some of the money if you want it. The American Institute for Research got 152000 152, uh, there's 137 more dollars added on. I'll give you the closest figure, 152000 The American Institute for Research isn't even listed by address where people can check it, can get their records. It's only a name. It could, this is the CIA working with the Army Intelligence Corps and the Army Chemical Corps. So I don't even know where the American Institute for Research is or who came out of it. They got 152000 Armour uh, gave 100000 The IIT research for $277,000. Cornell University got $19,000. Now, the purpose of distributing these contracts, these 54 contracts of 48 institutions, was partly, they said, to conceal um, the, the, the CIA and the government were behind it. They made these private institutions sign the contract that uh, they were responsible so that the real connection of the CIA would not be linked or the military intelligence. In other words, if you were being tested at Vacaville in California, you, you weren't supposed to know that the CIA was behind it, but almost every prisoner in Vacaville, with electrode or not, knew the CIA was behind it long before this went on. Well, we have the University of California with $159,000, Connecticut University with $188,000, Delaware University, $200,000, uh, DuPont put up $1 million, got a contract for $1,929,641. That's interesting because it was at the home of the DuPonts where Mick Jagger or the Rolling Stones stayed when he came from England before his hazardous tour and his finale at Aldermont where all the violence came down and thousands of poisonous LSD were scattered to the Hell's Angels. He stayed at somebody who, his manager was using the DuPont home up on the Sunset Strip. The DuPonts got a contract for $1,929,000. FM Corporation got $4,871,000. Friends for Psychiatric Hospitals got $18,792. Georgetown University got $22,000. Harvard University got um, $107,000. These are just round figures. Uh, Hazleton Labs, wherever they got a contract for $4,993,000. Johns Hopkins University, 76000 Ivy Research Lab, $145,000. The Institute for Medical Science, um, there's a figure that overlaps with the Ivy Research Lab. Evidently, they are one. I have them listed here together. Iowa University got $11,000. Indiana University got $28,000. What I'm listing here are the fundings of government contracts connected with the CIA, Army Intelligence, Army a chemical core that was trusting these various drugs into people with no medical records, no follow-up, sometimes faulty syringes, just experimenting these drugs, administering them, and freaking the, uh, these people out with the minimum of records. And uh, before I continue with some of these figures, when it came out that the government was involved in mine alteration and that uh, Dr. Frank Olson had committed suicide by leaping out of a window, 
Richard Helms, who was behind all of this, the CIA uh, operations for behavior modification, had all records destroyed the day before he left the Central Intelligence Agency and then left to become the ambassador of Iran. He obviously didn't want at least 4,000 records that they had available were destroyed. So we don't know if these people were permanently damaged or how many are institutions. There's one man that surfaced recently that said he volunteered for this program and that he's had epileptic seizures ever since, since 1957. So I'm going into the institutions that received $26 million. So you have an idea when you pay your taxes this year um, how your tax dollar was distributed. Maimonides Institute got 20000 As I said, Maryland uh, University got 158000 Mississippi University got 37000 Montesano Company got 710000 Mount Sinai Hospital got 25000 North American Agent Aviation got 68000 The New York School of Medicine got 11000 New Hampshire University got 48000 University of Oregon, 11000 there's an Olin Matheson, it doesn't explain whether it's a hospital or a person or a lab or a contract or what, 57000 Charles Pfizer, 435000 S.B. Pennock, 20000 The University of Pennsylvania got the, a large grant of 244000 and they used prisoners. It went to the university, and the university used the prison, and those were some of the most grotesque experiments, but we uh, don't have much follow-up on it. The University of Pennsylvania Hospital got 370000 The Research Triangle Institute got uh, 870000 doesn't say where that is, who was programmed, who could be turned into zombies, what kind of chemicals were tested. The Regis Chemical Company got 84000 Rutgers University got 43000 St. Louis University got 192000 Southern Research Institute, 22500 Stanford Research is a biggie because it's been behind uh, Colson Westbrook, who went into Vacaville and formed the Black Cultural Association. It's behind the plans to study this, the school at UCLA to study the causes of violence. They were going to use night bases and put electrodes into the heads of the most violent prisoners in California, and Stanford Research has been linked to much of the California violence by very fine researchers, and so it's no surprise that they got... 1,150,000 Stanford Research for Mind Control Experiments. Tennessee University, 69,000. Vanderbilt University, 51,000. Wisconsin, 301,000. Woodward Research, 852,000. And Yale University, 8,502. And, but there was more at Yale. This was just from the Army. Uh, they had their own source of funding for the electrode implants. Now, these um, figures, as I say, are just round numbers. I've listed some of the chemical agents and the purposes that were to be achieved, uh, such as contracts at Colorado University for exposure, nerve agents, nerve gases, incapacitating agents. And uh, they had 25 contracts. In Maryland, um, the names of these uh, contracts go out with experimentations after it were Indiana for University showed the effects of atropine and potential atropine substitutes. Well, we don't know what the substitutes are. We don't know who received this medication, who was altered by it. But this is just one study of the Army on uh, what they could do. For As I read before, the glycolates could blur vision, cause incoordination, affect the central nervous system. And the purpose of these tests, when it first started, was to interrogate. And then after they had the, the interrogation test down perfectly, they began what they called the operational and went overseas to uh, apply these beautiful chemicals overseas. There was experimentation at Silver Springs, Maryland, an Army contract, the American Institute Research. The objective, state objective, is to develop tests to measure the effect of incapacitating agents on the ability to perform in military or relevant tasks and they gave various chemical compounds, what they called psychoactive chemical compounds, where they tested deadly drugs, and today we don't know who was tested. We don't know where the tests were done. There's no message, uh, no uh, way to find out the results of the damage, and as I said, they used mescaline and LSD, and in some case, electrodes. In 1955 at Tulane University, the Army uh, grant on the Department of Psychology and Neurology went to patients at Tulane University in Louisiana, 
and they already had electrodes implanted in their heads. And then with the electrodes, they gave them LSD with mescaline, and these patients had wired electrodes in the brain. Baylor University, they, they studied physical incapacitating agents in human subjects combined with Demerol, morphine, and scopolamine. And the Institute of Mental, uh, Institute for Behavior Research, sedatives, tranquilizers, and a combination of four or five chemicals. Now, this is just one study from the Army of how much money, 26 million, went out to 54 institutions. And uh, you wonder how many people are affected today, how many people don't respond appropriately to what's happening to the world, how many people are silenced and walking around like zombies. You know, there's so much coming out in the news sometimes, I can't figure out why people aren't responding appropriately. Why aren't they up in arms uh, complaining about the news and what's happening and the falsification of evidence or what's going on in Washington, D.C.? But the answer is that maybe a great report of people that were really very compromised early in the game that would have been politically active were neutralized. How do we know how many people, say, in prison that were the brightest or the smartest weren't neutralized? How do we know that the... Uh, People that were selected in the CIA weren't neutralized. I've talked about Jimmy Carter's class of 47 at Annapolis, and there's, what, 50 ghosts, 54 ghosts. There's no trace of them. And uh, the old uh, people, the classmates can't find them. There's no records of them. Well, that's most unusual. The government certainly knows when a person starts Annapolis, a congressman sends in the name and gets uh, the background on the person. You know who the family is, and families usually know where uh, their sons have gone or who they've married, and why do they refer to them as ghosts? And the important thing is that uh, while these people have disappeared, uh, the only explanation or a possible explanation is that, like Dr. Olson, they have been altered in some way that even maybe they don't know who they are or the chemicals killed them or they had seizures or they wandered off. You see, one of the ways of spreading this chemical was called Operation Chaos. And this was written up in the Rockefeller Report, and I've studied it very carefully, and I've studied uh, the Senate hearings on Operation Chaos. And this was the most highly secret uh, inside the White House operation that, it, uh, that has ever taken place. It was the White House and the CIA together. And all knowledge was restricted to a need to know. And the Operation Chaos took place from 56 on in the United States and escalated during the anti-war movement. It was highly compartmentalized. The CIA used it. The same CIA that was doing the secret testing at these institutions that the Army Intelligence was sending out their chemicals for had a very secret compartment. And they, in order to get people in Operation Chaos, they spent two to three weeks in a formal training period, and then the subjects were heavily isolated from other CIA agents. I'm reading from the Rockefeller Report now. They were trained with extreme caution so that nobody else knew who they were, the ones that were going out into America into Operation Chaos, and the number of agents that were to be used for operational use at the exact time that the drugs were ordered to proceed for operational use was kept to an absolute minimum. And all communications between these CIA agents relating to the training of chaos was kept secret. And uh, only the very highest echelons of the CIA knew. All communications uh, never went outside their own offices, which was unusual for the CIA. They were isolated physically from every other operation, even the general counterintelligence staff. Operation Chaos, which is our American version of neutralizing an entire young generation, was kept separate from the ordinary counterintelligence staff. It was isolated, compartmentalized, even within their own group. They had an internal staff that, from the CIA that didn't know what Operation Chaos was doing. So that only the President and Richard Helms and then William Colby and Henry Kissinger and about 20 other people knew what was happening. And the reports from the Senate hearings indicate that Henry Kissinger was fer perfectly a well, well aware of Operation Chaos, and he got a report called uh, Restless Youth, and he was warned by Richard Helms that if anyone finds out what we're doing, we'd be in a lot of hot water, and it, it's dated um, to Henry Kissinger that he was very much a part of this Operation Chaos domestically that has been used surreptitiously and administered. In addition to the people in the institutions, 
private mental hospitals, county, federal, army agents, prisons. They also admit in the report that they took people at bars or drinking on the streets and just surreptitiously put a non-tasting uh, chemical into drinks and then took this person like a buddy to an apartment, which actually was a CIA safe house where they photographed them and observed them through the wall to watch their reaction to specific chemical compounds. But what the CIA did then, after this person was observed and thinking that he's in the home of a friend or a buddy, that he's met at a bar, he's turned loose and returned to his family, and the effects were never followed up. There is no report on the effect of how that person's life was damaged, whether he's been sane, insane, suicidal, whether he's admitted to a mental hospital. Look at the profit of the drug companies in the last 10 years, in the Thorazine, the Stelazine, the Prolaxin. Where did they find all these mental patients? Where did the drug company make the profit? Where did they get them off the streets to give them Stelazine, Thorazine, Prolaxin? Why are the mental hospitals filled with zombies on it? because they tested it surreptitiously and created the insanity with a chemical combat of about 35 agents, co any combination that you can make out of 35 agents, and sent them to 54 institutions for $26 million. And if that's the Army alone, I would say that the government maybe has spent 50 or $70 million out of, uh, say, Yale and Hughes Medical and so forth. If this is just $26 million from the Army, they administered it not only to people in bed and helpless in hospitals and in the service and in prisons, but just at bars. And then they turned these people loose. And all of a sudden, in the 50s and 60s, we have this instant insanity, and the mental hospitals are prescribing these medications. And all of a sudden, um, the drug business is a big business, and there are more people going insane than ever. I just cut out an article. In the Washington Post last week, the 44% of the American people are despondent and have no hope that things seem to be going wrong for them in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years, 44% of the American population is despondent. There's more suicides. There's more talk of death in papers. There's more talk of these double personalities, uh, like Sybil that was on television. Uh, there's a new person with 33 personalities. There's more talk of alcoholism, of o drug overdose, of chemicals being sold over the counter, and maybe this insanity has been created by the surreptitious administration through the last 10 years of these various chemicals that make people perfectly satisfied to sit home and watch uh, certain stereotype television uh, shows and take their daily dose of whatever chemical and accept their lot. Uh, maybe the apathy on the campus, maybe the disinterest in people in the politics and what's happening about them is that they've already been neutralized. Operation Chaos involved the chief of staff. Uh, there was immediate assistance inside this counterintelligence group. Only on need to know, the chief of counterintelligence, although he knew, the chief of counterintelligence of the CIA, although he knew what was going on, had very little to do with Operation Chaos. And Richard Helms, three months um, uh, he was into this thing and sent a memo to the chief of operations to refrain to disclosing his part in the activities in the counterintelligence group. They wanted to make sure that nobody knew who was involved in this. And there was absolutely no control over Operation Chaos in the CIA, the domestic operations. It was totally in the hands of Richard Helms, who admittedly, in the Senate reports, said that in 1947 he began the process of altering human behavior. And then William Colby came home from the Phoenix program, that deadly program in Southeast Asia, to become the head of the CIA. Richard Helms took no direction from anybody for this chemical program from 1947 on. This is in the Rockefeller Report. He was totally in control. And the, it, by November 72, the inspector general of the CIA felt that uh, this had gone too far. The sensitivity was too great. The matter couldn't be reviewed, and the Office of Management Budget uh, found out that the funds were concealed, that there was no annual review of this project, no normal review of the money, that everything was car compartmentalized. So the Operation Chaos worked very well after the CIA ordered that the testing be over and the operations begin. That's time is running out on dialogue conspiracy. That's the story of CIA mind control and maybe apathy in the United States. I'll see you next week on Dialogue Conspiracy. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. 
This has been Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist May Brussel, who for many years has been researching the facts behind political assassinations and conspiracies in this country. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California. And it's 6 o'clock, and this is KLRB Carmel.